Oh, hello there. Welcome back to the Agassino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agassino Zynga. This is episode number 280. That's 280. ¿Cómo estás, mi amigos mi, y mi amigas? Bien, bien. How am I? Pretty cool, man. I'm pretty good. Um, no, no, let's scratch it. Let's go back. I'm not really good, actually. I've had a pretty tough couple of days, but, you know, I'm on the mend now at the moment. Trying to get my, um, how do you call it, my mental health back in the place where it can be. But I'm happy to be recording this podcast, coming at you live and direct from somewhere in East London and giving you all the news that you like and know from myself, Agatino Zinger. And if you're wondering, Agatino, what's been going on? Why has it been such a hard couple of days? Oh my God. It's been hard. It's been difficult. A lot of stuff has, has happened. Um, a lot of stuff hasn't happened that's kind of caused me to go a bit into a spiral and just generally in life, isn't it? I think... Um, yeah, we're just, let's just get straight into it. Let's not waste any time with a mad intro. You know what to do. If you're watching via YouTube, smash that like button, hit subscribe, leave a comment. If you're listening via podcast app, five-star review, share with your friends, all that stuff. Yeah, let's get right into it. Let's get right into it, and then we can move on to the topic. So, it's been a hard couple of weeks, um, mostly down to the fact that I haven't necessarily come to grips with just how, um, with just how difficult it is to try and accomplish something, like, to kind of go for your dreams, right? Because I think, if I'm really honest with myself, the only times I've, this has been the only kind of period in my life where I've actually legitimately tried and put expectation on stuff that I'm doing before I was just doing stuff because it was fun, wasn't really tying any expectation towards it, wasn't, didn't really have a goal in mind, wasn't really looking at my, you know, at my right eye, hoping it can kind of pop off. I was just kind of doing it, just kind of, you know, going by it day by day. But the last two years have been, that where I've kind of really focused in and had some intention behind my actions. I've been like, okay, cool. When I do this, I'm hoping to get this and that. If I don't get it, okay, cool, but I'm hoping for this kind of result. So sometimes when it doesn't happen, it can bum you out, isn't it? So um, it's kind of, oddly enough, right, this whole period of time, it's also made me understand why some people are very much against the whole, like, self-help guru thing, right? The whole Gary Vaynerchuk thing, maybe even the Tim Ferriss stuff on one end of the spectrum. Um but yeah, let's say those two guys are probably the two people that get a lot of stick online from some segments of the internet, right? Maybe not Ty Lopez because he's like, you know, you know why he gets stick, right? Because he does loads of clickbait videos. But really at the core of his videos, there is a lot of value to be gained from it. Not the paywall stuff, you know, all that stuff is a bit cringy. But in terms of like, you know, creating a business that you don't need to like, um, you don't need to pour your heart over day in, day out to allow you to free up time to do other things. There's some good principles in there, right? Reading books. Um, when you get away from all the, you know, um, hiring scantily clad girls to do videos or the hiring of uh, exotic cars to pull people in, there's a message there in time of stuff. There is a message there. It's hard to dig through it, all the bullshit, but there is something there. Guy Vaynerchuk and Tim Ferriss probably get some justifiable kind of hate, right, in terms of Gary V. It's all rah, rah, rah talk, even though the last few years he's really made it an effort to kind of be a little bit more practical and give his natural steps, right? The whole like going to the flea market, the whole baseball card thing, reselling of trainers, um, TikTok, social media, how to promote stuff on Instagram, the amount of content to produce in order to blow. Like he's really been on it in that regard. Um, and Tim Ferriss, I'll say, has probably moved away from the whole investment thing and it probably moved really kind of that double, double, did double down into the whole like self actualization, right? Improving your life, kind of biohacking. But now, but I remember in the past, part of the reason why people didn't like him was because they felt as if like all he did was speak to really have sex with people. He didn't actually do anything himself that was crazy, right? Maybe that's the thing. It's apart from maybe all the books that he put together were collections of other people's wisdom as opposed to anything that he had specifically done. Again, I don't really agree with any argument, but I understand it now. Having gone through what I've gone through the last couple of days, I understand that um, it's the hard part about people listening to self-help gurus is that when they speak about the struggle, they speak about how to make it, they always kind of um, downplay this period that I'm kind of going through at the moment, the period where you're doing a lot, you're putting a lot of content out, you're making your moves, you're hustling, right? I'm playing all these random places, I'm putting myself out there, I'm being part of the scene, I'm, 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 I'm taking part in culture, I'm visiting some of the best places to go to, to, kind, of, um, uh, to kind of experience this these things um i'm recording a podcast i'm putting it out i'm writing blogs i'm doing loads of stuff right you're making content you're putting stuff out into the into the universe and there is an expectation in some way shape or form that it should have popped it should have popped off for you it should have you should have had your moment right it hasn't happened just yet 
Um, but then you read other stories of other people who are kind of in the same sort of like time frame as you because I think sometimes maybe it's not the best thing to look at it in terms of like a one for one or because he's doing she's doing this thing on video I'm doing a video then it works because you know sometimes people can just work for different things and they happen to blow at the right time you know it's different things that work into it but if you're going to be fair to yourself you might say okay let's look at this person who is in the same sort of time frame as me and they're doing things that are completely outside of anything that I could have even, even dreamed to do right now right you're like bloody hell isn't it and you start to get to a bit, bit, bit bitter, a little bit envious, a little bit hatey. And also there's a side of it where you just don't want to hear that rah-rah talk because you know what to do, right? You know it required you to just wake up every day and just create stuff, make content, put stuff out there. And hopefully over time, something will blow up for you. But it's also, there's a little bit of an understanding, especially if you're a sensible person, that sometimes it might be advantageous to kind of like listen to the universe right if one thing isn't going for you one time if it just doesn't work maybe it's the universe telling you that even though you've tried it was a good effort and you've had a lot of fun you've made some new friends because i don't think any journey is wasted i don't think going for your dreams even if you don't make it it's a wasted journey i still think there is something to be gained for uh going for something right starting a business um trying to become a singer um whatever maybe writing a book right that process or even making t-shirts right I've made t-shirts before 30 and I didn't sell one and then they all turned into fucking pajama wear, right? But there's something quite interesting about that. The fact that I was able to kind of like contact the screen printers, understand how to uh, submit the proper artwork, get stuff back, do quality assurance, packaging, um, the amount of tax you pay, blah, 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 marketing it up to, you know, to sell it on the internet, postage and packaging, dealing with customer service. All these things are interesting because, you know, if someone decides to kind of pick your brain one day in a conversation about how to make a t-shirt you suddenly got this blow off of information if you're in a bar one day and you just want some funny conversations to kind of break the ice you can tell your friends how you wasted five thousand pound printing you know a, a range of jumpers that you thought were going to be the next big thing and no one actually bought them so there's something fun from that and there's something educational from it. and again if we're only if we're only going to be on this earth one time if you believe the fact that we're going to be in this form that we're in now at the moment just this one time why not go for something? Why not have an experience? Why not write off some money and just having a, having a fun time doing something that you like, right? People waste enough money as it is going to the bars, hanging out with friends, eating places. Why not just do something that's an experience that you can actually look back on and think, wow, man, I can't believe I did that. So it's all well and good. But the thing people struggle with the most is that these periods of the sucky moments, you're not too sure whether or not it's a sign from the universe to tell you, hey, you've done it. Now stop and go and do the other thing you're doing. Concentrate on your, on your career because that's where you're going to actually blow up. Or is it just one of those situations that you go through that's just going to be... It's just a shitty situation. You just have to kind of dig in and kind of hope that you kind of get over it. What is it? That's the issue, right? You don't know what, what it is. And you don't know if it's like the universe slapping you in the face and telling you, wake up, stop trying to go for this thing. It's not for you. Or if it's just like a necessary... Uh, part of course is something that you have to go through you just have to go down this path it's going to be bleak it's going to be dark because you know especially the last two days it's been very bleak very dark and just in terms of just self-confidence again I, I wasn't i didn't think i was that person man i thought my self-confidence my um sense of self was quite rock solid but these things can really rock you right it can really just send you for a loop and you're like bloody hell man um but yeah it's been, it's been tough man it's been tough so I've kind of had to kind of get myself back onto an even keel, uh, devise a plan, um, get myself back onto like training again, going for a run, meditating in the morning, um, staying off the alcohol and the drugs and stuff, and just really getting clear. Because I guess sometimes when you're going through these rough periods, you can sometimes use alcohol and drugs to kind of allow you to not remember and to kind of just fast through through life. I think that's what I used to do a lot when I was at home. I was going through some problems with my parents and stuff. Like I used to use going out and getting wasted just as a way to kind of not be present at home so i just fast forward because i knew in the morning after going out all night i was going to get flipping bollocks, bollocks uh, a bollock in from my parents right i knew i was going to be called every name under the sun i was going to be you know just just you know the the kind of the strife that you go through growing up in like a very conservative family household isn't again it's not their fault in it they didn't know what to they didn't know what they were doing they didn't know they didn't know what they got themselves into moving to a new continent with completely different like lifestyle requirements for young people which is completely at odds with how they grew up in in africa and stuff it's just difficult isn't it so having to grow up with that i, I don't you know i don't really have any um thing bad to say about that i just think it's just one of those particular situations i went through so you can sometimes use those drugs and alcohol as a way to kind of just like fast through you just want to speed through life you just don't want to remember you want it to be monday again you want it to be wednesday again you want it to be friday again and bam it's weekend you can just forget about it so I think that's what I've been kind of doing. And, you know, sometimes the more conscious you are of the days that you're present in, it can kind of 
make you think, bloody hell, I'm so far away from where I want to get to, which is, again, stupid way of thinking about it, but um, that's where I was in it. So at the moment, I'm trying to get back to where I was previously. And again, I think the best way to do that is starting with the fasting, starting with the um, abstaining from the drugs and alcohol for now, uh, making sure I'm training again, making sure I'm running, um, making sure I'm reading loads of books. I'm just kind of maybe staying away from social because again I, was, I dip back into you know looking on social media too much and sometimes you can maybe get a little bit you would not i wouldn't say fomo but is it caremo como como uh, fit no fear of missing out on the career day i don't know whatever that abbreviation there's something about it right lifestyle fomo right where you're like bloody hell man especially because you know especially because sometimes you look at people and you're like, like legitimately you think you know what i'm better than you i really am like no hate involved no kind of like you know um, being, you know, what's that word called? I be, I don't know. None of that kind of meanness about it. Just, just from just look being a practical human being, looking at it stone cold, being, oh, I'm better than you at this thing. I am. So why are you more successful than I am at this very present moment? And again, it's a question that you don't really need to think about because everyone's journey is completely different. It doesn't because someone's doing that doesn't mean you can't do this, right? It makes absolutely no sense. It's, it's. I'd imagine that kind of thinking is similar to saying that. You know that in school you had those people that were like high school sweethearts, right? They were together since they were like 16 and they got married now and they still have a big family now, right? They're in like their early 30s. Because that happened to your friend, that doesn't mean you're never going to get married or never going to have a family, right? It has no, no correlation to you whatsoever. They're just going through what they're going through. There's nothing to do with you. So you can't necessarily look at somebody else, what they're doing, and think, oh, because you're doing that and I'm not doing the thing that I'll need to do. Somehow it kind of invalidates my experience. It makes me look rubbish. I look dead. I look like I don't know what I'm doing. No, that's not true. But you just can't help it. And it? it's just life. So I think that's probably why some people are so against social media. Because even with the best intentions, it can really, really mess with your brain. Especially when you're... And again, no social media specifically. But your, your, your thoughts already are, you know, going where they're going. And then you're looking at this thing that's reinforcing those thoughts that you're thinking of going. But sometimes when you're not thinking that way, it doesn't matter. You can just look at someone and think, oh, wow, they're at Fashion Week again. Oh, wow, they're going to, you know, um, Art Basel. Oh, wow, they're DJing this great festival. Oh, wow, they're DJing this massive club. You're like, okay, of course, it's great. Oh, wow, they've, you know, got this podcast guest. You're like, you know, you don't really think much of it. But then once you're going through some mad things and you're thinking some mad thoughts, when you look at that, you can be like, bloody hell, man, my life ain't shit. And you start looking at something real, you're like, bloody hell. So I really get that. But again, um. I think the last few days have been a time to reflect, a time to recover, and a time just to kind of get back to where I need to get to, isn't it? So I guess for anyone else out there that may be going through the similar sort of thing, because I know it's probably a thing no one really wants to talk about too much, especially in a scene, because it just, because I guess everyone goes through it. I must, they must do, especially when you're trying to do something, especially when you put money on it, especially when you put time into it, because, you know, I don't know, there's not many people that wake up at five in the morning to record a podcast and release it or make a DJ mix straight after they get back home or spend the next three or four hours when they come back and eat. Because I hardly watch Netflix, isn't it? Like, literally, I hardly watch series because for the most part, every day or every moment of my life where I don't have time, where I'm outside of work, because, you know, work takes up eight hours a day, I'm trying to pursue my dreams. I'm trying to go for stuff. So it's not like you meet a lot of people that are doing that. So when you're doing it yourself and you feel as if you're not getting anywhere, it can kind of be like, what the hell? But I'm sure there is a lot of people doing it, but they just don't speak about it because, you know, it's quite a it's quite a painful thing to speak about that you're doing something a lot and it doesn't feel like you're getting better, right? I'd imagine it's like back in the day, apart from maybe a few people in my school, most of us started off rubbish playing football, right? There was obviously a few people here and there, like, you know, the good, obvious example is Mark Noble went to the same school as me when I was in primary school. I mean, secondary school, sorry. And, he, you know, successful footballer now at the moment. But for the most part, it's very like most footballers just get better over time, right? You play a sport long enough and you start to get better, right? It's like skateboarding, right? If you learn how to ollie, um, it's going to take you a while, but you'll learn. And then suddenly you, you go from not being able to put, put one foot on the board and push to suddenly be able to push to suddenly being able to, to do a standing ollie, stationary, then to do it moving, then to ollie up things, ollie down things. Like it's just a thing that you have to go through. But usually you get better at it and you might reach a bit of a ceiling in your skills, right? You might just hit a wall and be like, that's it. But you see something happening. It's not. It's very rare you try something and you don't get just a bit better than where you were before the start. So I guess the creative pursuit can be a really, um, it can be a big mindfuck because you start from. Imagine you're releasing songs on SoundCloud. You put a song on SoundCloud and you get five plays. You get you you you, you somehow your brain tells you that five is no good, but a hundred is no good either. You suddenly have to for, it to, for your mind, for your mind to be happy of your plays, you probably have to be in the thousands, right? And even then, it's not good because imagine you've got a thousand plays, but you've got nothing, no one booking you, 
no one covering you on blogs. You've got no, no placements or plays. you just got 1,000 plays on things. It can be hard to really kind of rationalize that in your brain. Like, why is it like it doesn't make any sense and suddenly you start comparing and contrasting and then you get into a deep, deep, deep rabbit hole. So I guess for anyone else out there going through the same thing, my advice would be to maybe put down your phone, concentrate on the work and get back to living a healthy lifestyle. I think for me, the moment I've been going through my worst, I've not been living the most healthy lifestyle, right? I've not been sleeping well. I've not been maintaining my mental health. I've not been abstaining from looking at certain things. I've not been abstaining of maybe ingesting certain things. I've just been all over the place and then trying to work, which is not the best way to do it. So we have to kind of strip things back down to their real base level, take away all distractions and really just do it. Because again, if you're in it for the thing that you're in it for, you're not in it for monetary value, uh, a celebrity gain, whatever it may be, you'll be okay going through this messed up situation. You should be okay, really. And if it, if you're if you're not, then maybe you have to recalibrate your goals. But in theory, if it's really something you're passionate about, you should be fine to go through this shit. It's not a big deal, and it? it is what it is, isn't it? It's just a, it's a bit of a blip. It's a bit of a shitty moment, but you will come, you will, you will persevere in the end. Fingers crossed, right? You just have to kind of go through it. Um, so yeah, anyone going through that at the moment? I don't know. Leave me a comment below. Let me know what you think. Um, let me know how you go, how you got over a bit of a hump. Um, was it something that you kind of have to just live with? uh is it something is again when you keep getting hit in the face <laughs> do you kind of take that as a sign that you should maybe you know duck or maybe block and go somewhere else or do you just keep fighting through what is the solution there going forward i'm not too sure on the option but for now i'm going to do what i do best and what really has worked for me which has been to kind of you know eliminate some of the drugs most of the drugs and alcohol eliminate kind of you know really put myself in shitty situations make you sleep more work out some more and then usually it kind of gets me back in the best place and obviously some meditations will really kind of helps in that regard too so that's what i'm gonna plan to do going forward um but yeah it's been a tough one man it's been a tough one i need to kind of just get that off my chest and share it because i think um yeah hopefully it might help some people just to kind of put it out there because i think there is not a lot of conversation about that out there i don't think there is i guess we all know what to do in it when it comes to creative pursuits and we know that you just gotta put more stuff out there you gotta be diligent there you gotta be consistent with it you got to treat it like a job. You got to be professional. You got to just put no expectations into it, and hopefully the money will come later. You know all these things. We know these things, but in practice, it can be hard to really, really do it. And also, once you hit one stumbling block, that's when it really helps. It really shows you, really shows your metal. Like, are you really about this, right? When you start hitting a bit of a few hurdles, and it's not really going where you want to go. But anyway, what do I know? What do I know? Leave me comments below. Let me know what your thoughts are on that, and we'll talk from there. Anyway, let's move on into more like kind of um, optimistic and your happy stuff i've got some topics to talk about as per usual loads of interesting stuff to get through and then we're gonna go on the other side so let's just run through these topics nice and sh quickly so number one of course i'm sure you guys are aware of what's happened with gail king and oprah um there's been a lot of backlash with them which has been very interesting to see right um it's it ties in with me very neatly to this issue that i've heard a lot of people say especially people from like the root um the kind of black owned publication um, some other places too, maybe Shade Room has said the same sort of thing, and maybe Hollywood a lot says some same sort sort of thing too, where there has been an issue where a lot of these media platforms that are black owned, especially the American based ones or the US ones, they feel as if the big um black Hollywood elites, entertainment elites, they feel as if they get shunned by them, that they purposely stay away from giving them exclusives, giving them um opportunities to interview them or to feature them on the publication. They don't want anything to do with them for the most part, right? And then a lot of it was exemplified via this video that this guy posted on social media, right? On on Worldstar, sorry. This guy from The Root posted a video on Worldstar where he basically said that when you went to the Grammys, all the celebrities that were walking past on the red carpets, they were purposely pushing them. Ahead. They were basically telling them not to talk to the black-owned media. And I think for the most part, what they do with a celebrity, which is quite, you know, hor quite horrible for those involved, yeah, it's usually a pecking order. It seems like on the red carpet. So... As the celebrities are coming in from the, let's say, from left to the right, all the big publications are on that side. So all the like CBS, Good Morning, all those E Entertainment, all those really glitzy ones everyone wants to be on, they're all on there. But then all the kind of independent kind of ones, all the kind of ones that are bootstrapped, they're towards the end. So what ends up happening is I'm assuming most of the celebrities spend all their time, their publicists want them to go speak to all the big publications because that's where they're going to get placements. That's where they're going to have the advantage of sitting alongside maybe some people they want to sit alongside to help their career trajectory. And then they waste or they kind of use the majority of their time coming to through the red carpet on that section. And then by the time they get to the end, they've got no time to talk to the black-owned media. So it kind of looks as if they're purposely staying away from them. But I also think they are. If we're, very, if we're going to be completely honest, most black media is quite 
messy, isn't it? Especially the the the, the Instagram pages and that they they probably do more damage to uh, black celebrities' career trajectories than any other platform will do, right? Which is makes it ironic that a lot of people have a real big stink, make a big stink of what TMZ do, right? Don't get me wrong, TMZ's practices aren't the best, but some of the stuff that Shade Room pop out, some of the stuff that Bossit put out, some of the stuff that you know Lipstick Alley, all these places put out, isn't the most constructive to you know uh, perpetuating this image of how black celebrities kind of conduct themselves in you know entertainment world and maybe it's true maybe it's not but i thought this video was very very enlightening about the current issue at hand and maybe probably ties into what was said about gail king with um Kobe. let's see if i can find it here it was on da, 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 oprah's and tears where is it here uh, where are you 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 is it here i can't find it Oh, I don't, yeah, there you go. Found it, found it, found it. So it's, it's, it's this video, right? This video from Worldstar kind of really speaks about the issue that's currently on hand. Let me get up on the screen. Here we go. Oh, it's playing. It's a plane. It's taking ages. My computer's really slow. Please excuse me. Last night was the 62nd annual. Grammy Awards, and it makes it the 14th year that Black Tree TV has been there to cover the Grammys. Most things haven't changed over the years. I mean, this year was especially somber uh, with the death of Kobe Bryant, but the past years we've had the death of Whitney Houston um, and the death of other great people preceding the Grammys that's, that's made it somber night. So that's not totally unusual as extraordinary uh, a tragedy as it, as it was to lose Kobe. But I want to show you guys what really happens on the carpets because I, I, I usually give you guys a clean edit. You see the people we talk to, not really the people we don't talk to. But there's a struggle, especially for black media. The struggle is, is multifaceted. First, there's the placement that we are on the carpet, which is usually we're all bundled near the end of the carpet. Yeah, Second, it's the publicist that represent the talent, which you'll see in some of these videos. And let's fast forward a little bit because it's the bit where he basically says what he's you see them he see you see him trying to beckon them over and they're basically shooting them away right look, it's a Quavo. Look, 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 look. Quavo come on man do the black media man don't just do vulture don't just do the, don't do just don't just do people don't just do people Quavo come on Quavo how you gonna be for the hood like that I'm calling you <laughs> so of course right. Obviously, no one called Lil Nas X because they know he's like, you know, he's a proper pop star. That's not happening anyway. So he's, he's getting ushered down. Right. And then it continues here. Nothing's actually changing. Look. More black celebrities coming through. Aquí, por favor. I want to put it Sur America. Una preguntita más. Hay un tron, hay un troncón ahí, un troncón. Even traditional South American media is not getting any attention. So, yeah, that's the issue going on. But then when you watch this interview with Gail King and Leslie Jones, I think her name is, right? Or Leslie Owens. I've got her name. Leslie something. Anyway, this really famous women's basketball player who I not, don't have any valid knowledge on. It kind of makes you understand why some of these celebrities don't want to talk to black-owned media in the, for, the, for, the, for the most part, right? Because look what happens when they actually speak to them. Gail King thought this was going to be a good idea for an interview. And again, I'm, I'm not going to I'm not going to play the video because you're probably going to get demonetized. So I'm going to just leave the video off screen, but you can just hear the audio in the background. This is from CBS this morning, right? So snippet again. To in all fairness to Gail said King, that his let's legacy just pause is complicated uh, because of uh, the sexual uh, assault uh, charge. Uh, 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 uh. In all in all fairness to Gail King, CBS this morning did do her dirty, right? So I think for the most part, we're we're all aware. If you're part of, if you've ever done things on social media, done anything to do with marketing, you'll know that you do try and create clips or try and create some kind of clickbait in order to kind of engage an audience to get them curious to click your link and then provide them value on the other side right that's that's the ultimate aim so there are there is a i'm pretty sure there's a marketing a social media department in cbs that deals with all the clips and they're kind of um away from girl king's control but in their defense they wouldn't be able to clip this unless girl king says what she said right and the interviewers if you see the beginning of this interview again it's a five minute snippet and this probably comes around the three minute mark right three minute ten to be exact there's obviously it's a lead up question they're talking about you know uh Kobe Bryant's legacy what he did for women's basketball the fact that he was such a audience supporter of it the fact that his daughter Gianni was um obviously looking to pursue a career in there there's a lot towards that conversation that had nothing really to lead up to the whole sexual abuse allegation in question so if anything 
it still makes the interview worse because there was no need to ask these questions, right? It's not something we need to speak about in general, especially from the black owned media side of things, right? Maybe I get CBS, Gail King doesn't own CBS, Oprah doesn't own CBS, I'm not saying that, but from their side of things, there should be, you know how it's like, if it's your friend that went through something shitty, you're not the one that's going to be on social media calling them names and saying mad stuff or wanting to be cancelled. That's why I kind of view it as like, it's not necessarily you're kind of condoning their behavior of what they did, you're just going to remain quiet because that's your friend, right? And then maybe behind closed doors, you might chastise them, you might call them up and call them your name in the sun and say how they've kind of ruined your opinion of them, whatever, right? But in public, you're, most you're going to say is that I'm disappointed, right? I'm disappointed, that's all. But you're not going to say more than that. So imagine if your, person, if your friend passed and they did something messed up back in the day, you're not going to then, you know, the person hasn't even been buried. You're not going to say these things. So that's the problem I have with it. Gail King shouldn't have even said okay. this, but anyway, let's tell you what she said. Because saying. of the sexual assault charge, which was dismissed in 2003, 2004, is it complicated for you as a woman, as a WNBA player? It's not complicated for me at all. Even if there's a few times that we've been at a club at the same time, Kobe's not the kind of guy, never been like, you know, please go get that girl or tell her or send her this. Mm -hmm. I have other NBA friends that are like that. Mm -hmm. Kobe's, he, he was never like that. I just never see, have ever seen him being the kind of person that would be, do something to violate a woman or be aggressive in that way. I, that's just not the person that I know. But Lisa, you wouldn't see it though. As a spread, you wouldn't see. So that's the part of the question that I didn't really like. Because I think you can ask the question and be like, okay, that's completely understandable. And just for, in terms, and then you could just end it like, that wasn't intended to be a disrespectful question. I just thought it was something we needed to put out there. And then just move on, right? But the fact that she says that's not something that you would see, kind of implying that he could be a sexual predator, he could be a rapist, he could be someone that could do that stuff to a woman, is really distasteful. Because again, I guess because we live in a court of public opinion, right? Because people can get quote unquote cancelled, that somehow you can get found not guilty of a crime and people still feel like it's fair game to keep flogging you with that thing. But it's just like, I understand sometimes the criminal justice system can not be the most consistent thing in the world, but there is some kind of protocol, some kind of apparatus we have in place where if you do something wrong, we are able to put you up in front of a court of your peers, in front of a court of you know people in society, be able to take people from various sides of the criminal justice system in order to kind of d d dig in deep in the case, you know, an impartial judge, uh, jury, blah, 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 blah. If they finally come to the decision that, you know, you are not guilty or that there's no uh, basis for this allegation or to take it to court. And again, you have to imagine people are worth millions. There's a lot of money to be gained from the prosecutors and from the defense side of things. This thing goes to trial anyway. So in their interest, it should go to trial. If it doesn't go to trial, it's probably a good indication that there probably isn't much to it. And no one wants to be embarrassed. No one wants to be put through the trial system, have the opportunity or the possibility for that person being prosecuted, then come back and sue them because of, of you know, of how their reputation got damaged. So it's not as if, like, it's not as if the criminal justice system is hoping that he's innocent. If anything, they'd prefer if he was guilty, right? So sometimes we just need to be able to be like, okay, even though we think we under it's probably like the flat earth thing isn't it people think because they do a couple of google searches online and they are able to read a couple of bits of inf scientific information that they can somehow discount all the years of data and information and experiments and research has gone into kind of understanding the universe and the planet that we're on and they can not come to the conclusion on the earth is flat same with this right somehow people can think that they get, they know more about the criminal justice system or they know about this case more so than someone that has spent their entire life, that their livelihood depends on it. They know more than them. They can't just be okay with the decision that's been made. And maybe you don't even need to be okay with it. Just accept it and move on. You don't need to be okay with it or agree. Just be able to accept it and don't use the, um, don't use what happened to that person as something to beat them over the head with again. I just think it's really distasteful. And again, I think that really, it's a weird example, but I honestly think this is a, an, this is a kind of illustration as to why most of those celebrities that walk down the Grammy red carpet, Oscars red carpet, are very reluctant to speak to the black blogs or that thing because they know they're going to come with the mess. Because I think there is, un there is in the same way that he's going, hey, Quavo, Quavo, come on, you don't talk to black media, man, come on, man, how you going to do the hood like that, right? The, the, the reason, the, in, even thinking you're representing the hood standing on the Grammy um, runway is fucking insane, but the reason why he feels that he can say that because he feels as if like Quavo owes him something because he's black, you're black. They feel like they owe, like there's a kind of, you have to you have to be able to recept you have to be able to kind of like pay them back for all the stuff that you they've done for you. Some I don't know what what that is, right? But because in, in in reality, you know, this the talent is more important than the publications, right? Without the the talent, the publication wouldn't exist. 
um, for that regard. You, you could probably say without, without publication, the talent wouldn't exist, but I don't agree. Talent is more important. So the fact that you think that you're deserving or you're entitled to Quavo's time because you happen to share the same skin colour is pretty insane. But that sense of entitlement, I think, also runs into... It also seeps into the this idea that they feel like they can say whatever and ask you whatever because they're black-owned media. Like, they can come up to you and ask you about your baby mother. They can come up to you and ask you about your children, about your, the strength of your marriage. That really personal and intrusive conversations or questions that you wouldn't necessarily see a white or predominantly kind of general mainstream audience asking a popular artist or a popular celebrity or someone alias like a Brad Pitt or Andy and Jolie, right? They wouldn't risk that because they want them to come back on their show. Like, they wouldn't risk talking about you know, Brad and Angelina's um, relationship trouble in front of Brad Pitt. They know, obviously, publicists will tell them what's off limits, but they know not to play that game. But I feel like mostly black owned media, they don't really have the long term, the long, the long game in kind of mind. They kind of just go for the kind of lowest hanging fruit. They'll waste opportunity to get in front of Jay Z and just start asking him about what happened in Lip with Solange. It's like, you see what happened. You saw what happened, man. You heard what happened on the albums. Like, that's enough. That should be enough now. You've seen them out since that. Right, you should, you should. If they can move on, you should be able to move on too. But they don't. They just want the mess. They want the drama. They want the clicks. And somehow, oddly enough, it's happened to. It's happened to. It's it's it, that that kind of um, viral virus has kind of really um, permeated and run all the way across the kind of someone like a Gail King, who you would have thought would be a lot more, you know. But again, I'm, I'm I think it's a good thing because people have been looking at Oprah with a bit of a stink eye, right? Ever since her kind of complete silence on the whole Harvey Weinstein thing, right? She's been able to. She wants to. She went after Michael Jackson. Um, obviously retracted that in some way, shape, or form. Uh, went after. I think there's no mention of the Michael Jackson documentary on her YouTube page. Or it was all over her YouTube page beforehand. Now there's this kind of rumor that she's going to be putting that documentary about Russell Simmons. That's kind of going a bit quiet. Now there's somehow going after Kobe. It's like you're going after all these black prominent black celebrities. Of course we know why because you know Oprah's always had a bit of a disdain for hip hop culture in general. Um, it took a long time to kind of embrace it or to kind of accept it as part of black culture. She didn't really want to promote it for her own personal reasons, which is, you know, no problem about that. But it's good to see that there are some questions being asked about their position and as if they're kind of like hallowed position. They're kind of like, oh, we can't talk anything bad about them because they have to be black. So no, like we have to kind of be honest with ourselves as a culture and be like, hey, maybe we're doing ourselves a bit of disservice. Maybe we're really damaging, you know, same way how, you know, you can talk about police brutality all you like, but, you know, the biggest killer of other black people is our black people, right? So let's get to the real core of the issue and then we can start dealing with the other things outside of it. But if we're not dealing, if we're not kind of mess cleaning up our own mess in our own rooms, then we can't really go out there and start telling the world how to do theirs, right? It's a bit disingenuous, really. Um, I would think so, in my opinion. And then on the other side of it, you got what Snoop Dogg says, which is just some completely insane, right? <laughs> but this is Snoop Dogg, and he always says something. He always says nutty stuff. So I'm not surprised. I'm surprised people why people are surprised that he goes out on a limb like this. But the way Snoop Dogg talked about her wasn't really nice. Yeah, okay. Out of pocket for that shit. Way out of pocket. <laughs> what do you gain from that? I swear to God, we the worst. We the fucking worst. We expect more from you, Gail. Don't you hang out with Oprah? Why y'all attacking us? <laughs> we your people. You ain't coming after fucking Harvey Weinstein asking them dumbass questions. Okay. I get sick of y'all. I want to call you one. Is it okay if I call him one? Funky dog head bitch. How dare you try to tarnish my motherfucking homeboy's reputation, punk motherfucker. Respect the family and back off, bitch, before we come get you. Mm, that's a bit too much. And also, I think, I just, yeah. I don't know. I just don't think you can. Number one, I don't, I think it's fair game, right? I think if TMZ did that, no one would be, no one would have anything bad to say about Snoop if he said that about Harvey Levin, right? Let's, let's just be fair. Everyone's, oh, protect black women. It's just a ridiculous statement to make out there, isn't it? Everyone should be protected. No one should be made to feel like their life is being threatened in public, right? Everyone's life is sacred. Let's be fair about that. Even Harvey Levin. But if Snoop Dogg would have said that about Harvey, no one would have batted an eyelid and be like, yeah, you know, TMZ's trash, TMZ's the devil. But the fact that he says that about Gail, everyone's suddenly like, oh no, we can't say that about our black queens, our black mom taught me never to talk about it. It's like, come on, man. If Kobe really was 
Snoop Dogg's friend and they actually were homies and used to kind of hang out at his house, look after his daughter. She'd be coming over looking after his kids. You you could you're not you should be surprised that he would have that kind of visceral, emotive, aggressive reaction. It makes sense. Of course it's out of line, it's out of pocket, don't say it to anyone. But the fact that somehow um they're above reproach in that re- they're above like automatic um emotional reproach is a little bit ridiculous in that respect. But also again, like I'm saying, I just think it goes to it just goes to illustrate the the bigger problem at hand is that we feel it feels as if the kind of those elite guys or kind of like you know um, hip hop Hollywood entertainment elite guys do feel as if their own black publications are probably doing them more harm than good right by perpetuating this kind of negative image or stereotype of black performers but on the other side they also need them to kind of repair their image to kind of tell their story blah 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 so a, there's a very conflicted relationship that kind of goes on with them which i think is really um coming to head at the moment especially with this whole Kobe bryant thing because it seems as if Kobe bryant because again i wasn't really a big basketball follower but it seems as if he was a very popular figure amongst some of these guys and this is boosie's reaction to it quickly hey, King. why the fuck would you ask some shit like that I don't give a fuck who friend it is. I don't give a fuck she can uh, Obama. Uh oh. Why the fuck would you do something like that? Why would you do that to your people? You know what people are going through, right? Why would you ask a fucking question like that? Trying to tarnish somebody's image. Mm. You do that to your own black people. But. Crack at the, crack. You say it. I'm finna fire your ass up. Yeah, you. It's a sound of crap, a crack academic, isn't it, really? Isn't it? That, that, that did, even though that was maybe, if you believe the conspiracy theories, maybe the FBI was responsible for bringing it into the black neighborhoods, but, you know, who who really profited it from, from, from it the most? Unfortunately, the black gang at land owners, isn't it? But yeah, that's the controversy that's happening at the moment. Again, um, RIP Kobe, isn't it? The I guess again maybe the kind of that the um, maybe all these bad things that are happening really goes to speak about how big of a person he was and how impactful he was. All these things that collateral damage has happened since his death, it goes to show how big of a star he was. But Jesus, man, you would like to die in peace or rest in peace in some regard, right? Especially during such a tragic incident like this. But what can you do, man? What can you do? R.I.P. Kobe. Hopefully the memorial goes down well. Hopefully no one's life is put into jeopardy and stuff, and everyone just kind of is able to take the lessons that he kind of imparted onto the world and make the world a better place in their own little different way but some of the stuff that's happened post his death has been a little bit distressing to see man it's really kind of torn the entertainment apart and the entertainment world apart people are into forming different factions talking about different things just got a bit crazy but anyway what can you do let's move on um so um moving on to trainer news there's these new shoes i thought i would see that i didn't really see reviewed anywhere else that i thought looked really interesting um nike sb gts right I'm not familiar with the model, don't get me wrong, but I'm also liking what they're doing with the actual colorways themselves, right? So it kind of looks similar to like an, an Air Max 1 put onto like an SB, put onto like a GTS sole, like you know that GTS that Supreme did back in the day with the sort of like embroidered sole, embroidered swoosh. But it looks, a, but because of how it looks with the upper, they've kind of adopted these Air Max 1 colorways onto it. And this first colorway is uh, the, the, you know, the, the tip, the kind of quintessential classic Nike Safari colorway, which if you're a big fan of sneakers, you should know this colorway um, off like the back of your hand. A very kind of iconic model that's been retro maybe six or seven times and still really does really well when it comes out. It's still a staple of most people's sneaker collection and just kind of we're very well up there in terms of the colorway that sneakers that of Nike puts out. But I think in the model, it looks really cool, man. So again, it's a Nike GTS um, SB. It's got a GTS sole, but then it's sort of like a, a Nike Air Max 1 upper. And again, I told you before, I'm not really the biggest fan of hybrids. I think they look crap for the most part, but I really like this. I think it looks bloody fantastic. Um, you got the all leather upper with the Safari mud, with the Safari kind of, um, what, is it, what do you call that? Guard at the front. Um, no perforations, completely leather, all really buttery and soft. You've got like a kind of nylon. Uh, the only difference I can see here, because I think original Safaris have the leather insoles um, or leather inners. This has got like, sort of like a mesh inner. And yeah, for the most part, just like a classic, classic colorway. Nice, real, leathery upper. 
uh, but a soft leather upper actually that will probably look good once it's all creased in and been skated in and stuff. I would imagine, you know, stuff, you know, rubbing, scratching the side of that kind of safari print, doing ollies and stuff on your skateboard will really make that front bit look really cool. And just generally, just a really, really classic and clean colorway that I'd be very um, interested in adding to my collection. Um, this is an article from Hype Beast. It says the Nike SB GT S returns to premium takes on the familiar safari colorway. Um, the Nike SB is using the sleek GTS as a tribute to the influential Nike sportswear release this spring. And the first homage uh, packed colorway, this is my piece actually, of the low top sneaker shoes to appear recognizable safari colorway. A Tinker Hatfield design shoe in 1987, an SFI recognizable uh, pockmarked a pockmarked print was inspired by the high-end couches and has been used on everything from legendary Atmos take on MX1 to the Air Presto and Air Foam Posit. Awesome. Uh, Mid-foot overlays and suit shoes are alike and constructed of a stark black leather, blah, 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 um, down to below the thin white rumble of midsole. Um, the Nike SBGT Return Premium Safari is available now via Atmos, which is awesome. I like how they're just doing this again, which is nice. They're making G JP exclusive shoes, which is great to see. Hopefully we see more of it coming through in the future where they are kind of specifically released in certain models, especially certain kind of like core lifestyle, um, tier zero kind of like, you know, spec level of Nike products in Japan only. And then once it kind of picks up steam there, you might be able to kind of then see it um, sold in other kind of select retailers around Europe. You know, I think of like, you know, an end clothing. I think of, you know, um, a patter. I think of maybe a foot patrol. And then, you know, and then it just stays there. So you can finally now get quintessential kind of like tier zero general release type shoes but they're not really sold in sides or office which is great right so not everyone's going to wear them but they're also something that you don't have to pay you know 10 times the retail value to to kind of get them you can still probably get them pretty cheap if you buy them on stock x whatever maybe because there's not much resale value on these i don't think so um more commemorative styles are yet to follow as well in the coming months so that's that obviously cool to look at again 82 dollars under 100 dollars to buy really clean and sleek design and again i'm a big fan of it man and then the second one i saw which i was really keen on was the second colorway which is like an air max one colorway that looks amazing so you've got like a sports red sort of like classic colorway that i thought that was really good and again works really I, I, again i'm not a fan of the hybrids but i just think the idea of putting that kind of um overlay on top of a gts model with those kind of color wave combos just looks beautiful and this is another example of it and again just imagine um with the influx of people wearing kind of retro 90 DC shoes and stuff, I think this fits in really well with it. It looks very much like an old school 90s um, SB, right? It's not really. It's sort of like, you know, a model that they've kind of reinterpreted and kind of, you know, added into the current lineup to kind of make it more interesting. But it just looks like a 90s kind of shoe, like a Kalis or something. I don't know. I just guess that I get that kind of vibe from it. This is from Flat Spot. This is a Nike SB GTS returns in premium sports red shoe. So I can the sports red Air Max One kind of colorway, which is, you know, if you're familiar with it, it's a black and white. It's a kind of red, and, red gray and white, uh, red um, accents with the sort of like gray, with a kind of gray suede midfoot kind of area and then mesh on the toe box. And then you've got the uh, other edition where it makes it really look interesting. The fact that they've kind of separated the... Uh, the outsole colorway and the midsole colorway so you get that kind of nice bit little black pop on the bottom which again is very adept at because very um leaning into the whole like um 90s era of having kind of maybe clear outsoles with a white outsole with clear outsoles with a white midsole or maybe like a rubber sole on the black upper that would look really cool if they happen in the future but again just a really really clever cleverly done model and something that i think should be a lot more popular than what it is i mean if these get skating of course they look fucking banging but just as a kind of lifestyle shoe with some nice stone wash denim will look perfect and it's the kind of shoe that annoyingly is available now in my size and i can burn it myself but all it takes is one trendy person one person like i can asap rocket to wear these and suddenly they sell out everywhere and you know you can't get them anymore but it's such a great model i would love to see this again in like the sport blue sport red maybe an all black upper style but just taking all the classic air max one style colorways and kind of adapting them to that model i think will look amazingly interesting and again just the, the idea of the soul without the bubble on it that kind of low sleek profile the fact that it's completely flat on the forefoot none that banana tone nonsense is just a very very special model that's something i'm very much a, a fan of um but inside the dense, so there's dense mesh what's the detail here dense mesh uh, reinvented for the greater flex and grip, the cup sole, oh, the cup sole too is pliable and, and a standard design. And the underfoot tread features a skate specific traction that puts the grip exactly where you need it to be. Yep, very very much a, a favorite of mine so far. So again, if you're not, if you haven't, if you're looking for something new to get, I don't know from the Nike SB range, I would definitely advise to check out the Nike SB GTS available now. Um, of course, on Flatspot and all your other SB retailers and stuff. So check that out.
Moving on. What else we got here? Ada Superstar Laceless. Laceless run the MC tributes, right? These are absolutely disgusting. So cool. Um, I remember these coming out during the Superstar 35th anniversary collection, but they were just the thin, soft, thin tongue ones. They they didn't have the padding on it. Do you remember that? So I think back in the day when Run DMC used to wear these, I'm pretty sure the trend was to stick the sock underneath the tongue to make it puffed out and then take the laces off, right? And then after what they ended to get more uh sick or to get more amazing with it they'd stick the sock on inside the tongue and then put the so they stick this the, they'll get a sock kind of make it into like a little sandwichy sort of shape or roll it around stick it on top of their on top of their foot and then put another sock on top of it so that the sock wouldn't move around and you get that kind of real puffy big style i remember we used to do that back in the day too about superstars when that was really popular i remember back in the day we used to dress i think that was the kind of like the trap style look back in the day you'd wear like an armani or a Versace shirt long sleeve with some jeans and some Air Max 90s. That was like kind of the so solid crew days, right? Back in the day, like having a little signet ring on, you know, cubic zirconians on, uh, riding a super bike. Yeah, that kind of stuff. I remember that was a big thing back in the day. And then sometimes you'd have like superstars on with nice, crisp, like, you know, long sleeve shirts that are usually Imperial Armani, usually Versace, maybe Ben Sherman if you were a little bit, you know, on the chav side of things with some Air Max 95s, like just some great style. But again, I'm eager to see how these go down with kids nowadays. But I think these look fucking beautiful. So this is from um, High Snob IT. And the Superstar Laceless first look and release info. And this salutes Run DMC with this new Laceless Superstar. And as you can see, looking at the pictures, right, you've got this uh, Superstar 80s model, which is, you know, the quintessential Superstar that everyone's a big fan of that got retro by the Adidas Originals team that just smashed it. You've got a kind of off-white uh, sole. You've got an off-white um, shelter at the front and then the midsole as well. You've got the great shape. You've got the, just the luxurious levers, the, you know, just amazing kind of overall detailing in the actual shoe to make it not look like the GR superstar you can get from like, you know, Argos and stuff. That's just terrible. This is the one that you want, right? And they're usually pretty well priced as well. I, mean, I think around kind of like the 80 to 120 uh, pounds mark. But then if you go into the other pictures, what you do see as well is that they've got the addition of the puffy stuffed tongue, which I think they, I don't think they even did this for the SV model. I'm not too sure if they had it for the, uh, the Superstar, it's the Superstar SBs. I'm pretty sure Superstar SBs don't have a puff tongue. So the fact that they've done a puff tongue on this is going to look great because if you want to wear them like Randy MC with laces, it'll be look amazing. Or if you want to have them really wide and uh, big fit, similar to like kind of, you know, the breakdown style with the massive kind of uh, laces, like back in the day, like kind of the like old school kind of LA Kudri style, you can do that as well. Um, again, just look really fantastic. Look, you've got a puff tongue there. You've got, of course, if you look deep into there, you can see the elastic as well. That's kind of going to hold it in place, which is a really thick piece of elastic. So it should hold it in place really well. And it's right at the top too, which kind of helps with the overall shape. And just in general, you get it in black as well, which is the quintessential classic colorway as well. Like just an amazing tribute to Run DMC. Um, so let's see the information regarding the hype beast. Uh, brand, Superstar. Da -da. The key features, the signature design elements of the Superstar are featured on the Superstar Laceless, including the free strap branding, the gold logos, the shell toe cap. Here, however, the laces are removed and an, an elastic band has been implemented on the interior to ensure the shoes remain in your foot. It's going to release the day before Valentine's Day, so February the 13th. That's next week, Thursday. Priced at ninety dollars, uh, you can buy them at setretailers and ads. dot com. Ads no. Randy MC has reportedly teamed up with ads for an up and coming collaboration on the iconic superstar silhouette. So I'm assuming there's going to be some clothes as well, probably tied in this. Um, Head of the launch, however, the brand with the free straps will be releasing uh, a new laces version of the sneaker as a nod to the influential hip hop group. Run DMC, as well known for rocking superstar shelters and tracksuits, prior to the masses catching on as a legendary group, would prefer to wear their sneakers without laces. I just present the superstar laces in two classic black and white colorways. You have a chance to snag a pair when the laces superstar releases on February 13th. That's amazing. I really can't wait to see what these look like in real life. I can't wait to see who actually buys them. Hopefully kids actually look into Randy MC, start watching some documentaries and kind of, you know, having a little bit of a renaissance themselves because, you know, if anyone deserves it, it's those guys. And they've been through a lot. And these kind of, these shoes really stand the test of time, really. You know? A really good moment in hip-hop history. But again, an amazing model, man. Really well done for Adidas again. Um, and again, I can't wait to see what these kind of do when they finally hit the market. So definitely check those out next week, isn't it? Next week, Thursday, they're going to be releasing. So yeah, great model that. Let's move on. Da, 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 da. Beams, uh, beams. So this is quite cool. I just saw this recently. Actually, I just just only just now onto my list. But 
Beams recruits New Balance, Arterix, and LL Bean for their Spring Summer 20 bag, which is a pretty cool little lineup of people, right? So, you know, Beams, great Japanese retailer or Tokyo-based retailer that you should be familiar with who have their own kind of, you know, in-house labels as well and, and that they kind of run. Um, and in general, you know, they don't really miss with their collaborations. It's pretty evident that they do really cool stuff and they make it look very, very easy. And I think this collaboration is a really good example of it. Um, so this is an article from Hypebeast. Um, I've got it here on, on the screen. Beams recruits New Balance, Arterix and LL Bean for Spring Summer 20 bags. Never to want to, this article, never want to slouch on seasonal collaboration. Beams is kicking off the Spring Summer 2020 season with uh, Sukhoik, have you pronounced that word that makes the sandals exclusive, followed by a host of bespoke bags. The special goods include joint efforts from, LL, from New Balance, Arterix, LL Beam and a Japanese label face. Beams and its various sub-labels continue to long-standing partnerships with each label imagining everything from lightweight totes to mountain ready parkers and i think it's really cool i think because they're you know what the advantage of being a retailer first is that you can do multi multiple uh brand collaborations and not have to sign exclusivity deals i'd imagine so again i'm not too sure maybe beams gets a, gets gets maybe Beam gets around it because maybe the i don't know maybe the kind of the contractual law in japan is different than what it is in europe like maybe if you sign an exclusivity deal Maybe if you sign a deal to do collaboration with New Balance in Japan, you have to do it in New Balance Southeast Asia, right? Which I'll assume isn't doesn't have the same sort of stipulations that they would have in Europe, so that you can somehow be able to finagle doing a new. Because I've seen stores do New Balance uh, collaboration, then the next week do an Adidas, the next week do then then the following collaboration do a Nike. When most retailers you see in, in in Europe have this kind of okay, we did this big Puma collaboration. Then you have to wait a whole 18 months or two years until they do something with Reebok and then it kind of goes on, goes on. So it seems as if they have an exclusivity deal with that brand and they can't do any other collaborations because they don't want to, the brand usually don't want the collaboration, every other collaboration after the fact to kind of impede or to kind of, you know, make them forget or make the public forget about their collaboration that they did. So there's a little bit of a protection of image or brand in that regard. So maybe in Japan it's not the same, I'm not too sure, but I just love the fact that they're able to kind of do these multi-label collaborations at once. And then retail, and then the customers are able to kind of pick from all these amazing brands that they can kind of vibe with, or maybe get used to other ones. I, I think it really works well. Again, I'm not really the fan of these exclusivity deals because I think if you're a no, if you're an unknown label, if you're a face, for instance, or a cult label like that, it's quite cool to have your collaboration sit alongside industry vets like New Balance uh, or Beam and Arterix. Like it's quite a good thing. I want to be next to them. Um, it's gonna actually help my brand because when they put like when they merchandise a store and they have their little 20, season 2020 bags section, people are gonna come to maybe buy the Arterix bag because they know what Arterix is but they might also see my stuff and be like oh, actually that stuff is pretty cool too and pick it up so I don't think it's such a bad thing um, similar to like albums dropping right if you're a big artist if you're an underground artist yes maybe dropping your album the same weekend as Drake isn't advantageous but so what in it like if you're not that well known, it doesn't matter if you drop in a dead week. I'm still not gonna listen to you anyway. But sometimes, if you have, if you have do have, if you do drop around the Drake Day and Spotify um, edits the homepage to make it look as if like we can discover other bits of music and you pop up on my discovery page, I'll give you a listen. So it's probably advantageous to drop at the same time as him. Of course, if you're famine thinking and you're in a scarcity mindset, you might be a bit apprehensive about it. But you know, um, still sharp and still, baby. Let's continue here. Artrix's ongoing exclusives include a Mantis 2020 backpack. I like that everyone's did this the different thing for Beams Boy and two shoulder pouches and an emblazoned Beams branded offer the sustainable Beams Boy. It was also just another collaboration with New Balance Advertisement Market Tote. Uh, elsewhere, technical garment accessories from Label the Face serves as a freeway helmet bag of Kudura Woven Label. So it's amazing, right? So you've got three different different three types of different three different brands three different bags the actual style on this one and the new balance tote bag is amazing you know it's sort of like amazing kind of hobo style with the big overcoat nice rolled up jeans new balance worn and a massive tote bag looks bloody amazing maybe we're going to see those actually get retro whatever that new balance is i actually had a pair of those in orange that were just too small for me to have to sell on which is annoying but hey um and you got this amazing artrix backpack like if this, this one thing that we know about japanese labels or the Japanese arm of a particular European label is that they really know how to make bags and accessories. Like they don't skimp. As much time as they spend on making great outerwear pieces, they can actually make a great backpack too. It's bloody amazing to see. So you've got this great backpack. You've got another amazing shoulder bag sort of thing. You've got this great sort of like a head porter type sort of like tote bag, which looks really great. I think I saw it before an article, someone saying that um, smaller bags are out and now bigger sort of like tote bags are in for men which is great to see because that telfar bag is going to go 
like OTT um, these next few years. Of course, people are going to kind of uh, latch onto it. But I just love everything about this, man. It looks amazing. Uh, again, a nice... I think that... I'm going to say it's a being couch, to, sort of like a um, canvas bag. Yep, definitely is. Just amazing. Every cl- every, cl- every every collection here just looks great. I'd wear everything from this collection overall. Like, so, so good. Um, you can't really go wrong in anything here, really. Um, what we've got here in terms of dates. Expect the collaboration of bags to launch on Beam's website. It's Japanese lo- location in February, March, April. And again, nowadays with proxy services that you can use out there, it's very easy to get these kind of bags. I'm sure if you contact them via Instagram or maybe DM them in general, you probably might be able to get a response too and get uh, get yourself one as well. So it's not as difficult as it was back in the day. Because back in the day, it was super difficult to get hold of these bags. But even nowadays, I think for the most part, kids unfortunately are still only buying stuff from certain brands. So they don't really, this doesn't permeate. Unless kind of Young Lord, uh, sorry, Asap Bari, Rocky, Travis, you know, the usual cohorts, Lucas about where these things normally care. So you can get away with it if you're clever and look for stuff that's a bit like under uh, under the radar and kind of, you know, really email them and plead your case. They'll probably be able to help you out. And especially if you're ready to pay, don't email people and ask for proxies if you're just thinking about buying it. If you've got money to pay and you can pay instantly and wind the money through PayPal, do it. Get on, get involved because I'm sure they'll be able to help you out. And again, great collaboration. Starting from February. Loads of stuff is dropping really early in the year and loads of big heat, man. So definitely check it out, man. Really cool collaboration. I'm a fan of everything that's involved in this pack. Um, really well done. I think this backpack's probably the standout for me in that collaboration. And and yeah, and maybe this kind of pack from the face as well, which is, is it face, I'd say? Face for F forward slash, yeah, pretty sure. But yeah, definitely check it out. Uh, Beams recruits all these free cohorts to make like, you know, the free horsemen, the bags, man. Bloody amazing. I'm a big fan of all of it. Let's move on. Do, 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 do. Uh, last one about men should wear more makeup let's probably talk about that one before we kick out of this whole episode and i'll see you guys again another day let's go for this one so what is this bbc sounds right male makeup helped me get get me out the door every day okay this is very interesting I'm not too sure if this is going to vibe but let's just hear what we have to say i've not actually listened to this actually this is from uh daniel gray is set up his own cosmetics brand after dealing with body dysmorphia he's worn makeup for the last 20 years and wants his products to be suitable for everyone and encourage men to try it out it's not just men in their 20s who are buying the product right so let's see what, we, what, what, what he's talking about here what's this daniel gray is there makeup where do you get this from hmm <laughs> let's see if we can find a picture of this stuff first before we listen to him talk daniel gray makeup where is that is there a video about it? War Paint, our founder's story. Is it called War Paint? Okay. Interesting. Interesting uh name for something, isn't it, right? Okay, let's hear what he has to say on, on, on BBC Sounds anyway. The story all began with me in middle school. So when I was about 12 years old, I was bullied because of the way I looked, because of my appearance, which affects me massively ever since. But growing up 13, 14, started getting spots because I was so conscious. I started using my sister's makeup to uh, cover that up. I've been wearing makeup for the last 20 years and the confidence boost it gave me was uh, literally life-changing because I suffer with a mental illness that's uh, body dysmorphia. For me to have a something like makeup to use and feel comfortable using it, using it has really uh, helped me. Now, interesting, right? So he says he, he started wearing makeup because he, had, he was suffering from mental health issues and body dysmorphia. The issue is probably with men's makeup is that I guess men's makeup doesn't come from the same point as women's makeup. Women's makeup, for the most part, comes from the point of view of women wanting to look i guess some would argue if you're jordan peterson you'll say women wear lipstick in order to be sexually in order to kind of uh signal their sexual desires right some would argue against that if you're the vice guy who's getting interviewed you say that's stupid people wear make women wear makeup for themselves right but the truth lies somewhere in the middle right there is there is some group of women who like to just feel good about themselves and the best way to feel good about yourself is to make yourself look more attractive than what you actually are uh, objectively speaking because most women would say that they look probably better with makeup than without. But it doesn't necessarily mean when you wear makeup, you want a guy to, you know, suck your face off or to kind of, you know, um, have or to get a guy to hump you, right? In a cl- nightclub somewhere. That's not what you want it for. But there is that idea that you're mostly coming at it from your own kind of one of uh, self-worth to kind of make yourself feel better. But if you're a man and you get bullied because of how you look due to acne or due to other sort of skin conditions or just because you just don't look as attractive as other people in your school, that isn't necessarily the same thing, is it? Those, like we, I, I guess if you're a little girl and you put a lipstick on you want to look because it's what you see your mum doing right it's like oh wow she's a woman I want to be a woman too right women uh, or little girls mature much quicker than boys do um, they have a maybe a more of a need of sense of self than a boy would do or an understanding of who they are 
or who they are in society. The idea that if you're a young girl, there's that weird experience when you're growing up and going through puberty where suddenly men start looking at you differently, right? You start seeing them kind of desire you sexually, romantically. That can kind of really fuck up with your fuck with your brain. I expect for most dudes, you don't really go through that, really, do you? Right? You're pursuing people. Don't get me wrong. Whether or not what what depending on what way you swing, you pursue people, but you don't necessarily. I don't know whether or not you feel the need, you feel desired like in that way in order to kind of perform and to kind of peacock. I don't know when when you when it actually happens. I really don't know. Um, I'm not sure when it's, when that's a thing, and maybe that's the core of the problem of why men's makeup did hasn't necessarily taken off because men are coming at it from so many different angles. They're coming at it from him dysmorphia, body confidence, bullying. Uh, they're coming at it from kind of just um you know that kind of. Uh, just wanting to look hotter. I don't know. It's something different. Whereas I feel most women generally come at it from the same general point of view as opposed to just want to feel better about themselves or want to look pretty or want to look like a woman, right? This idea that you look like your favorite Hollywood actresses or something. I don't know. I'm not too sure about that. Basically, you on? Let me get out of the, the door every day. Are you wearing any makeup now? I am, yes. I wear makeup every day. And my staple and go-to product is foundation. So that's just a nice, even coverage across my whole face to even out my skin tone. Sometimes use a bit of concealer and now and then bronzer and anti-shine, especially on a night out. I don't know whether this is the right thing wow. to say or not, but I can't tell that you're wearing anything. That's good. I think that's the whole point what we're right. trying to do with war paint is dispel the myths around what a lot of people think men's makeup is. You know, in the papers and press previously, it's been about lipstick, eyeliner, guy liner, where for me it's simple products, use a simple way to even out your skin tone, make it very subtle. So Which is similar to what they do in TV production anyway, right? Anyone that's on TV, if you've ever been on TV, you'd know that, you know, for the most part, you always get given makeup. Doesn't matter what how good your skin is. They want to make sure that, you know, your your face hits the cameras in an even way, because you know, the amount of lights they use in studios, they can't afford to just have your greasy forehead sticking out there on TV. So they usually always give you some kind of makeup just to kind of even out your tone of your face, right? And it's never really, it's never really that obvious. It's kind of just like slight, just to kind of make sure you look a certain way on TV. And if that's all it takes to kind of make men feel a little bit better about themselves, it shouldn't really be a problem. I like the name as well. I think wall paint's pretty cool. It gives it a little bit of a masculine edge because I think, again, I think if you're the, if you're on the more, if you happen to lean on the more feminine side of masculinity, you'll probably be more, you probably wouldn't care about wearing women's makeup, right? If you're James Charles, you're fine, right? You just go out there and wear women's makeup and it's okay for you. But I guess if you're a uh, a more sort of a straight heterosexual male, you might feel a bit weird about wearing makeup, like lipstick and having blush on. But if it's something that's just about to kind of even out your face, then it should be fine. And maybe anyway in general, because men are weird like that. Maybe a lot of people are using it anyway. They just don't talk about it, right? Men, for the most part, they just use it anyway. And they just keep it moving. No one needs to know unless they know, right? Um, it's similar to like the dudes that go and get plastic surgery six pack. There's plenty of men do it. They just don't speak about it because it's no one else's business. I definitely understand that, but I don't know, man. I've really intrigued by it because I've always wondered like why isn't there more males makeup, especially considering how vain a lot of dudes have become in the last I don't know ten years. It's even because you remember when everyone was complaining that remember when everyone was teasing David Beckham about being a metrosexual, right? It wasn't even that he was probably one of a few people that was you know really at the public eye, a straight male who was really giving a shit about his appearance. Now it's even more, right? You look at the guys on Love Island, like, you know, th those guys don't go three days without getting a haircut, right? They're always in the gym, looking after their diet, you know, uh, using the best fragrances, moisturizing themselves, getting great tattoos, right? They're really about looking after their body. So this idea that somehow Dave Beckham was going to, you know, feminize, feminize the whole entire men <laughs> society is crazy because nowadays men are probably more feminine than they've ever been. But also a little bit more cautious about not saying what they're doing in public. They don't want everyone to know. They're kind of a bit, you know, behind closed doors about it, which is okay. You know, it's, it's your own thing. But I don't think it's a bad thing to kind of put it out there. It gives you confidence. Confidence isn't down to a skin colour, isn't down to a sexual orientation or Agreed. anything. Confidence is something we all need. So for me, this is everyone. We've had interest from all around the world. If you wanted to get men to try it for the first time, you have to make them feel comfortable with something, you know. So... To get it designed and aesthetically looking like how a man would want it is key as well. We're not going to be for everyone, right? We're not going to be everyone's cup of tea. Like we think it's absolutely ludicrous. Mm -hmm. All I want to do is by creating a male-specific brand, let people decide what they want to do. Everyone probably think target audience, 28, lives at home, expenditure, goes to the gym every day, but it's definitely not. So exactly. online, our second best customer base between 50 and 65. I knew it. Yeah, so it shows makes the sense. breadth of, sort makes of sense. men who are looking at this sort of homosexual, straight, 15 year olds who suffer rosacea, 65 year olds who want to cover their dark circles 
And these are people who never thought about using it before. That's amazing, man. I'm really encouraged by it. I think it's pretty cool. Definitely check it out. It's called Warpaint by this guy called Daniel Gray. So again, um, amazing work by him and all involved. And I'd be interested to see how far this goes. It's something that you see a lot more men getting involved in. Because I do think there is a segment of men out there who are really... Cause especially you look at stuff that's coming with the hair stuff, right? People getting the, the, the hair glued on and stuff. There's a real big need for some men out there to who feel very inadequate when they're losing their hair, when their skin is all messed up. So if everyone, someone would be able to provide some kind of level of service to kind of um, help these guys, I think it's a good thing. Why not, man? Why not? I mean, women have loads of bloody products that help them feel better about themselves. Why not men? And in regards to where they're coming from direction-wise, I don't something to help them with it, and I think it's all well and good. So definitely check them out. War, I think it's called War Paint, isn't it, by Daniel Gray. Check that out if you're that way involved. And again, I'll leave the link of the interview on the show notes so you can check it out yourself. But anyway... This is 280 of the Exynos Show. Thanks so much for tuning in. My memory looks like it's going to get full up, so I'm going to duck out for now. As per usual, if you're listening to this via the podcast app, please leave me a five-star review and share with your friends. If you're watching via the YouTube app, then please smash the like button, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment. Uh, let me know what you think of the show. And yeah, I guess I'll see you guys again tomorrow for the episode of the show. Um, I'll keep in touch. I'll make sure I update you on how I'm doing mental health-wise and making sure that I'm looking out for myself in the best possible way. And I'll see you again very, very soon. Until then, take care, be safe, and thank you so much for tuning in. I'll see you again again. Bye-bye.